Okay, let's get into the real main event here. Should I, an artist who has under 100,000 monthly listeners, be using meta ads to promote my music? <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> let it be known that i am within physical striking distance of jesse <laughs> why, why don't i start it from my thesis here i'm gonna need everybody to follow me for a second here so we can all agree that the algorithms like spotify etc are based on showing what you do to a pool of people as best they can figure out that is likely to like what you do and if you keep doing well, they show you to a bigger pool of people over and over again. Adam Mazzari at Instagram just said as much. They made a whole video trying to make people understand this. And that is largely how algorithms work. My thing that I have seen over the years is I study two things mostly, which is one, how do artists break? And the number one thing I see, I was in a particularly good position to do this since at Atlantic, I was often the, one of the first people to talk to an artist after they were signed. So I'd always say, was Facebook ads one bit of this? And the answer is consistently no. So that got me down a rabbit hole of thought, which was then when I started working on a lot of campaigns where people had done Facebook ads, I would see not the same growth I'd see with other people who did not. So then I started thinking about what is this and going deeper and deeper. And so what I became convinced of after so many A-B tests, after so many different people, is that when you use Facebook ads, you're getting the lowest quality music fan possible, especially if it's on Facebook itself and not Instagram. Instagram can be better, but the people who click ads are not the people you want to be targeting because I do believe that the quality of fan equals greater quantity in the pools that they send you to an algorithmic playlist. When they're testing you, they're testing you on a pool of people who I don't think are the best first listeners to get things. Whereas now with the ability to do outside influence TikTok campaigns and things like that. So what I've never stated that a lot of people here decide to make me say is I've never said it doesn't work. The quality of a song will work. It's a great song, very mid-marketing works. And what I also don't say that a lot of people attribute is that Facebook ads are always bad. I just think when there's a budget or not, there's always a better way to spend the money that is more effective for growth. So just to add to your case real quick, Jesse, mm -hmm. I thought it was kind of confirmed that Spotify ranks certain early adopters' choices higher than like a late adopter, from what I understand. I haven't heard it phrased don't, that way. But don't they have that thing where it's like the people who discover music before it breaks earliest, like they tend to prioritize their choices in the algorithm or whatever? Well, I, I've seen it more that the the people who test out music. I know for a fact Reddit does some more where the people who click the new yeah. tab are weighted higher than the uh, hot tab and their clicks are the most important clicks. But I've not seen that confirmed for Spotify. I have experience there, and I, I I will say this. I agree with the point that ads will not break an artist. You can't go and spend ten thousand dollars and say like you know and and break or a hundred or even a million. It just doesn't work that way. And I agree that in terms of fans, organic reach is going to net you the best type of fan. Those points I concede with. But what I see it is that it's all spokes in a wheel. And the wheel can't function without its spokes. And just like organic needs to be there, there there's these things that just have to exist to ensure that you are maintaining relevance in people's lives. But I will say this, because you guys are talking about the, the algorithmic power of Spotify. The biggest reason to run ads is that. We're never interested in listener ad listen stream i'm interested in how can i take that listener shitty or not and leverage them for the algorithm and so that's yeah. why when we when we and we have so much experience with this where there are certain countries and people and cities that will trigger spotify's algorithm over the u.s culturally spotify treats them as sort of uh, indicators for what's going to do well in the United States. And so meta ads can be an extremely powerful tool to leverage the algorithm. And so if I have an artist, let's say starting from zero, what we will see is that ads can bring them from zero to 2000, 
with like a modest ad budget of like five hundred to a thousand dollars a month. But the point is that those two thousand listeners in a month need to trigger the algorithm to get them to ten k, and that's the ratio where we see success. And why ads are so vital is once you have those people, then you have an understanding that the ads, okay, the ads are targeting something correctly here. Let's dig into yeah. it. Let's test things. Let's funnel them down. Absolutely. I yeah. This it's that. So the two things I always say is one, the organic starts the fire, and then the ads is like pouring lighter fluid on it. But if you don't have something actually meaningful for people to think sink their teeth into, then yeah, you can put a million dollars into it and it's not going to work. You can have if if all you did was you had five of the best video assets in the world with a, with a great song, but then nothing else, nothing would happen. You know what I mean? Because it would just be like, OK, people saw it, but then they had nothing to engage. Right. Like it's more about like raising that awareness. And I think it's what Dustin said. Exactly. It's about leveraging that one guy who goes and listens, right? You spend $300, you get a thousand people over to Spotify. It's not about the, them all listening to the song twice. It's about Spotify going, Oh wow. All these people listen to that song. We should show it to more people who like similar things. But it, obviously that is contingent on the song being good. They're being good video assets. They're being stuff for people to sink their teeth into. So they actually go back and listen to multiple times. Yeah, would you basically agree with that, Dustin? Yeah, I. That's exactly how we run our campaigns, and it's a foundational thing. It's it's like you know, great. We're going after organic. That needs to be there, but then also there needs to be some kind of sustained growth that you can lean on and retargeting these people and making sure that like they live in a world where there's relevancy. And by the way, that can be extended into adding budget. Like if we have a piece of content doing really well. Cool. Let's roll that content into ads and extend that budget. Now, let's let's say it's in the country world right now. There's so much country press outlets on TikTok and Instagram. Then let's roll a budget into getting them supported. Going after those influencers, like that's that's just another way of forcing. Um, it's a media buy in my mind. It's it's not any different than it. It looks better because it feels organic, but it's an advertisement. Whether that platform is going to say it or not. And so, so to me, it, it services the same function, but I think I don't care if an artist has zero followers or they're, um, it Billie Eilish. I think there's a role for ads to get started ASAP. My caveats here should be that the reason I also go on this is I would just rather spend that money on other things. Like right now, basically everybody who tells me I have an ad budget, uh, we're doing this TikTok outside influence thing that uh i built out where to explain it here you have an artist profile on a device that has never touched the artist profile we then are making somebody going here's the five best gent songs of the summer and the artist is in it then we have a separate account that looks exactly like that influence account that we're running ads on and targeting both the followers of both accounts and the followers of the artists we'd most like to do. And we're running ads on that. I'm finding that because then when people jump from TikTok to that, I'm seeing better growth that I've seen with any Facebook campaign I've audited in my life. Well, I think the problem there though, retargeting that early on is that no matter which way you dice it, it's going to be more expensive. So then it's a conversation of, is it cheaper to do it that way or cheaper to leverage Spotify's algorithm with sheer numbers of maybe low, lower quality fans? You know, and I think that's that's a discussion. But I love the ability, though, in the ads to force like if, if an ad does well, it means that the song is particularly good. Yeah. Right. Because the song can't just be great. It has to be like fucking amazing for those ads to do really well. And so you get a better read on what to do with the rest of your campaign so for me it is dollar one in my opinion it because it, it, immediately you can test all the content you can test everything all in real time yeah and this is i think the really 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 valuable part to me within spending a hundred dollars i can already get a sense of like how i want to direct marketing for an artist going forward or like what's going to make sense or yada 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 and you know, like pretty quick, whether it's working or not and optimize and yada, yada, yeah, whatever. 
Whereas, like, I don't really like things where I have to put, like, a thousand dollars up front just to maybe see if it works. Well, explain. I want to hear your, your model that you just mentioned is a strategy I've I've never heard about. So you said you you launch a, essentially like a, a a fan account. Fan account's probably not. Fan, fan, well, I call I literally call it an influence account. Like where you're yeah. like so. The, my favorite one is this one that I actually like got into as a fan. It's called Music at Midnight. It just kind of curates the type of music I like, like the hyper pop, anti pop type of stuff. And but then it's like the funny thing is like they were doing a lot of those videos of like here's the four best songs. Now the funny thing I started to notice is, huh, the same artist is always at the top of the playlist and in the videos. I wonder why that is. And you know, not to make it too hard of an accusation at somebody, it could just be that they're a mega fan, but I started to say, what if I did this for this artist we're struggling with now? And sure enough, every time I've done it, it's worked better in every way I would measure, even if we don't even do the ads. One of the accounts, funny enough, like they're now like, oh, it has more followers than the artist. That account has gotten but popular. How do you find like an influencer to be like the person who does? We it? just do slideshows and narration. Oh, OK. Yeah. So it's, it's actually faceless. Now, the big problem is, is if it's real. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but everybody's claiming that all these platforms are going to start making faceless content go away because everybody's just dumping AI shit into the pool. Yeah. Which is funny because I just had a conversation about a niche bit of content that I love, which is uh, AI generated like dark fantasy content. Oh, really? Which is its own genre, even though it's AI generated, takes a lot of creativity and it's it's really fun shit. Would you see that next time? Like when you see one that's really good, could you text me one? I'd be very curious to see it. Dude, I'll send it to you. It's yeah. some well and we have this one brand. It's it's a sync licensing brand, but it's just one classical artist that does a bunch of sync licensing and we were talking about okay how do we make this content go and i was sharing these accounts and it's always the same song like with mm-hmm. this particular genre it's like the variety is the the video and it's always this same like sort of like nostalgic sound but i'm like this is great like we do the fan account stuff all the time what yeah. i was curious yeah. about is you said that you then launch a mirrored account yeah. Yeah. That so, is here's a great that, example of what we do. So let's say the account's called Colt that's doing the influence. I then take a uppercase I instead of the L and make it look exactly like it. So you think you're getting that thing you already follow, but you're really <clears throat> getting the ad account. Hmm. Which is smart because TikTok ads ruin yeah. accounts. You know, I talk to ten new musicians a week and I've seen enough <clears throat> to say there is no doubt in my mind that the second you put ads on it, you are throttled for the next at least three to four months, no matter what you do. I've never seen anyone get out of that hell. Dude, I worked with American authors last year. Oh, yeah. And great, great band. They were crushing it till October of 22. They ran heavy ad campaigns. And after that, you just couldn't break 300. And that's American authors. Right. Like it was just, they came to us like, I, we don't understand. And that's one example, but we've seen the same exact thing is like the ads. I don't know. I don't get the logic, but I think what it is is exactly what you said. The lowest common denominator people engage with those ads and then destroy the algorithmic reach of those. And, and this is why you need to be thoughtful. Like, I think also, though, if you're like thoughtful about that targeting, you can kind of overcome that. TikTok is a lot harder to do that with, in my experience. But like, you know, and you definitely have to do some experimenting within meta to find like the right people to target, you know, but it's like, it's consistently been my experience, right? That if you go narrow and thoughtful, you're a lot better off with your ad targeting than if you go broad. And most people just put in, you know, alt rock, and then let her rip. And in 99% of cases, that doesn't work. Every once in a while, there's a way to make it work. But yeah. So I have the complete opposite experience, especially oh, yeah. since the iOS changes. So we we run media tests before every campaign where we test out different audiences. Yeah, Dustin, could you, could you explain that like they're five, what that means so the audience follows you? The idea is that we want to understand not just like what are the best performing ads, but which ones are actually creating conversions on Spotify. So when we run these ads, let's say we set a budget for each ad at like $100 
an ad set and they actually run to their own individualized playlist. So we can actually track on the back end of Spotify for artists, what ad, and we, 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 they all look the same, except there's a little watermark, A, B, C, D, whatever. And so we'll actually say like, Hey, this ad with this creative and this targeting on this placement produced X amount of listeners and X amount of streams. Because sometimes even if it produces, and this goes back to back to your listener quality question, if it produces a lot of listeners, but not a lot of repeat streams, then it's not as good as the one that produces fewer listeners, but with repeat streams. So and that that key data point is how we get around the low quality engager. Uh, we also target the US because what we have found is that in this media test, if the US is resonating with something, if it's like more in the rock world country, Europe, South America is the way we go. If it's more pop oriented, we do Southeast Asia. But we realize that it does correlate to those markets. But ultimately, the idea is to figure out what audience and which placements are going to be the best spend of money. And in our mind more recently, and it used to be the way uh, you were talking about uh, Matt, where it's like get specific, but more recently we we've realized it's an optimization game and that what you need to look at is big audiences that are very separated in the Venn diagram of audiences. So like, I don't want yeah, that's to key. similar artists and then, the genre they live in, it's the same audience, right? What I want to find is, okay, we're going to target genre, fine, but let's target bicycling and let's get content because let's say the band likes to ride bikes. And so we got content of them riding bikes to their own music. Let's target that audience or fishing or, and so we've, we've zoomed out a ton to where these audiences are massive, but they're separated and the content is focused on targeting that audience and optimizing, giving tools for optimization. So that, and we have found that when we start targeting more heavily, the ads just don't perform as well. I mean, they're fine, but they're not how they are normally with bigger audiences. Interesting. This is about to go down a very, very nerdy rabbit hole. I'd be curious to go on a Zoom with you to like show each other how we do the work because there's a lot of like weird layers here that we could get into that. You would like that, wouldn't you? You'd like me to walk you through (laughs) I mean, you know, first I'm stealing your great ideas so I can point and smile. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, the, the ad stuff is so funny to me because I used to get really uptight about like, you know, not sharing about whatever. But at the end of the sure. day, and I think we all know this, the ads don't mean shit. It, it's the content at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah. Hold up for one second because I think I have something that you'll find really interesting. So over on my members only feed, which you can get access to for $5 a month to get over five hours of videos, I interviewed this really interesting artist who's a member of the community named Nico, who goes by Jen. And as you can see here, they have a lot of monthly listeners. We have a big conversation about how they built that fan base up, including using Facebook ads on Spotify playlists. So if you're interested in this conversation, I think you'll really enjoy that. But let me tell you a little bit more about these memberships. A lot of what this channel depends on is memberships. And what I do for my members is every week I discuss what's changing in music promotion, the small tips, the things I'm testing out, and I dissect thoroughly for 20 to 40 minutes an episode, the artists who are blowing up and finally getting the fan base to listen to their music and exactly what they're doing to do that. So you get five hours of this content for $5 a month. I also answer all of your questions and listen to your music on monthly streams. So if you want to sign up, there's a link in the description or hit museformationlabs.com for more information on what I do. Okay, back to the video now. And I also think I was just dealing with someone from a major label who has a lot of success doing streaming ads and they do it like completely different from how me and my team do it, but like, it's still working. Yeah. It's just, you know, like, cause meta ads manager is such like a weird, complicated tool that like, there's definitely people who've like found a way to do something different from how we do it with my people. You know, you know what I'm saying? Which is different maybe from how you do it with your people. Even if we're all getting like relatively similar results, well, I would say that it's always an op- game of optimization. And well, I, yeah, exactly. I think it's like how you optimize and give it tools to optimize is the key. And sometimes you can be successful despite your efforts, right? Like you could do things in a the least beneficial way, but it still does well because the content's good, or you accidentally stumbled into the right audience. Yeah. So we were testing with. Bridge City Sinners the other day, you know, who are a really, really great folk punk band. And we have a few really high quality assets and they're pretty accessible and they're accessible to like 
pop people who want something a little creepy, but they're also accessible to like folk punk people, obviously. And like, but they're also like crust punks can listen to it because like folk punk is like the new thing in punk in general, right? We just ran it to like a bunch of weirdly different audiences, ranging from like mainstream metal to sort of like Avid Brothers fans to folk punk people to like crust people. And it works on all of them because it's that thing. Like you can't fuck it up when it's the best quality. Yeah. And it'll find it. I will say though, that sometimes the content trying to find the right content is so infuriating. The best performing ad I've ever had. And I'm not an advocate for copyright infringement, but this ad is, is it was pushed by the label. And I was like, this is not a good ad. Also copyright infringement. And they were like, we don't care. What's the copyright infringement? I'm curious. So uh, on the top was uh, the Joker from the Joker movie doing the dance down the stairs on the bottom, right? Is one of the split ones is some car game, old car <laughs> game. It's sort of like the subway servers, but it was some old yeah, yeah, and yeah. it was all blurry and shitty. And it just had the song in the background and the song, I will say the song is perfect for the Joker. The lyrics, it made a lot of sense. It was horrible. And it was insane. I mean, that artist went from nothing with that one song to half a million monthly listeners with the ad alone. But this is the thing. This is the thing is if you focus on really organic feeling and looking content, especially in certain genres, like we're almost like it feeling shitty, like makes it better. Yeah. Like a lot of like a Squela grind, the like hardcore death metal band I manage technically grinding death violence. Like a lot of their most successful early viral moments were like cell phone footage of some crazy shit happening at a show that felt like your friend filmed the coolest band they'd ever seen. And then you just, and then you saw it. Sometimes you can turn that into an ad asset and then it happens. Doesn't matter if the audio sucks. Doesn't matter if the video kind of sucks because it feels like what that audience is consuming with their friends. Well, yeah. and it's funny too, because especially if you have an agency, you're always improving and part of that is like let's improve on the content and you go in this direction i feel my whole team doing this there we're constantly improving what we do including our production but then it's like hey we we kind of need some shitty content like a category of content we always test is lo-fi right you just you got to have it baked in i i think one of the more interesting things especially like when i was doing a lot more stuff with ads was always that if it was humor based we could get that to perform and get click through rates I've never seen before if it was actually very funny or if we found an audience that found a satire very good. I could get twice as good click rates of anything I've ever seen with that. But the funny thing would be is those listeners would never go to another song on that artist page ever. Mm. It was unbelievable to look at the Spotify yeah. statistics of like, you know, you're usually getting at minimum a 10% migration thing if you're getting a lot of repeated listeners on it. On a song, this was like 1% was a good day. I wonder if there's some correlation to the type of person who clicks on an ad to the type of person who only listens to songs, right? Like, because I, I kind of see data like that too a lot mm-hmm. and where it's like there are people who are just interested in songs. They don't care about artists exploring discographies. And I think that there's some connection between the two. This is a really interesting thing because I think about a lot. I used to – I ran a lot of record stores when I was young and I worked at uh, Humongous Tower Records at one point. And if you bought Cake or Bare Naked Ladies or Creed, you would never buy another CD with it. Because those were the not passionate music fans. Those were just like, I've heard this a million times. I want to hear it more. It was a particular type of fan most of the time. And it's the same thing that a lot of people say. It's like, there's that joke about Swifties online that they've never seen any other concert, that they don't listen to a lot of other music, and that it's just a very narrow base fan. And that is the truth, that some things provoke that. And I think that might be correct is that like the person who's listening to satire is probably listening to a lot of comedy podcasts rather than a lot of music. But I also think it's, it's that thing we talk about a lot in terms of content marketing where it's like, Jesse, you could go post some goofy meme of me with your dog making fun of me Mm -hmm. and get like 5,000 likes. But that wouldn't really be like anything relevant. Like people would go and follow you, but they would be following you for the wrong reason. Yeah. Right. It's like all these people who make comedy content go viral and then get sad that nobody wants to listen to their music. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> and I think it's like the same thing with the ads. It's like, yeah, maybe you have less of a click through when the ads aren't funny, but it's also like someone consuming that Joker and car game video is not consuming, is not intentionally consuming a piece of music content. They are consuming a piece of meme content. And so that means that if they're consuming something for meme reasons, they're not paying, like the music doesn't even register. Yeah. Like if you're consuming something for music reasons, then you're going to go and, you know, and I think that's really important, right? Is like, and this is something I always try to like, because sometimes I get like a funny idea for content that I'm like, oh, well, I'm not sure I could actually make that a bacon spit because it would just, I know it would get, you know, however many thousand views. But I also know if the content is not tied into my core brand, mm-hmm. then like I'm going to, you know, I could get 500 followers from that, but like that's not really going to work. It's like one Almost of the things worse that really- too, because then if they're the next people who see me, exactly, I find it interesting because I oftentimes compare myself to people who have a more, a wider audience. They're not as niche as we are mm-hmm. and they'll have a hundred thousand followers or whatever, but they're also talking about a dozen other things and I, it's tempting, but then you realize in the long run, it serves no purpose that there's a ceiling on each of these platforms for what we do. It's like that for rock music, especially too. Yeah, no, like, I mean, I always have to remind people, I'm like 100,000 monthly listeners in rock is a million in EDM. Yeah. Like that's the same size artists and same size tours because the pool for rock versus the pool for EDM is not the same thing. It's the same thing with trap. But also it ties into what you were saying earlier about people who are sorry, what Dustin was saying earlier about people who consume songs versus mm-hmm. people who like are into music, you know, cause I think part of the part of the rock mindset is like, I am a music fan and I go to shows, you know, in a way that doesn't necessarily exist in a lot of other genres. Well, isn't that just the nature of niches, right? Like yeah. people well, who exactly. enjoy niches are passionate about it. A final point, I guess, on the meta ad thing is, and this is, I think, one of the biggest things that fucks people up and that you need to be very aware of, is that if you don't know exactly what you're doing, which means you haven't spent a bunch of time watching every Andrew Southworth video, and then, because he has the best guides for how to do this. He's he's an amazing, amazing YouTuber and resource. He's a great guy. Yeah. Right. We love Andrew. If you haven't spent, you know, 10 hours watching his videos and tested with a thousand dollars of your own money, how to do that. And you just try to think you can go in and learn and go streams, go burr. You are going to waste a bunch of money and it's going to be really complicated and you're going to hate yourself. So you need to be willing to spend the time to invest both the money and the time to like do it right. Cause if you don't do that, I personally administer a hot, a mid five figure sum of ads every month. I still fuck up every once in a while where whoops overspent by a thousand bucks have to cover that myself because like meta has a bunch of really dumb shit in there. Most recently all these AI improvements that don't work where they try to be like, I don't know if you've dealt with this Dustin where they try to be like, well, actually, here's what we think your budget should be. Or actually, let's just put this filter on your content without really telling you, you know, and it's like dude, the, the, the AI ad copy suggestions make me laugh because they're always yeah. they're like, hey, rock and roll fans, are you ready to rock and jam to my newest track? You know, and it's just like, <laughs> yeah, and this is what I'm saying. And this is what I'm saying is like. Meta tries to make it look like, oh, it's accessible, and the AI wizard walks you through the fucking thing. No, it's and it's like, no, if you mess this up, you will waste a lot of money. And it's worth hiring, even just hiring a small agency like mine for like one campaign just so you can see what it's supposed to look like and reverse engineer because so many people waste so much money on this. And I think we all have horror stories of that. Yeah. Probably another reason why, not to defend Jesse's point, why if you're going to talk about things you can do, (laughs) probably not. If you're an independent artist and you're like, is it going to get me further to spend this money on content or ads? I could see the point of saying like, let's spend money on content. hundred percent. Yeah. Like, because if, if you're not willing to fuck with it or pay someone consistently to fuck with it for you. We we do weekly audits where we'll literally go through every single ad that we're running 
Every single week. I mean, I, I think about it's four meetings, four hours worth of meetings between four people every Thursday. The amount of money we're spending on just auditing, that's how easy it is to blow money. We figured out that is cheaper than not auditing the ads because we save money by not having to pay out of pocket for mistakes. Yeah, this is the point. 